I'm out in our backyard of our little half acre site and thought on this hot day to take a break in the middle of the day and do a long form video update wander of our backyard garden. Kind of a meandering wander of where things are here in peak midsummer in the craziness, the jungle likeness of our backyard space. So if that sounds compelling, please stick around. Quick note before I get into that, I wanted to acknowledge and appreciate folks for being patient and thoughtful and considerate and helpful in the previous video. It had a lot of different comments around the, the permies.com leadership award and currently working with someone to or a few folks to volunteer and make a comprehensive list of all the entries. So I'll find some way of sharing that with everyone later on. For those of you that had concerns or problems with it, I really appreciate you sharing too. I just want to say all that. So where to begin in this crazy space? Oh my gosh. So a lot of random things happening, a lot of uh, very well established systems that are deepening and getting ever more complex, almost, I, I almost say to a fault, but I think the reality is it's, it's very special, but we're bumping up against, rubbing up against the true limiting factor of understanding how to deal with the management and the harvest of some of these nursery stock systems that have been set in motion. So let me say that in a more clear way. Like for example, right in front of me, pretty much every plant you see here were plants that were put in a year or two or three years ago with the intent, okay, we'll grow them for a year or two or even a year and get them moved on. We'll sell them, we'll plant them somewhere else. And then things just get in the way. Life is busy and so they stay and they stay. And now we're at this strange inflection point, uh, crossing the roads. Like for example, this Antovnica apple, which is now at least nine feet tall. I was gonna graft something onto there. <laughs> I was gonna dig them up and put them elsewhere or pot them up and sell them maybe. And now here they are. It's, uh, it's an interesting and wonderful challenging moment uh, to figure out what's next with this. Do we cut some down? Do we just leave them all? The leave them all modality seems lovely, but also really challenging. Like here's a rootstock European pear that's about 10 feet tall. Probably would be nice to move them when they're dormant in the fall. This American persimmon, I don't remember even planting them. I kind of feel like it might have been a seed that fell here, but they're clearly a female. There's a couple of fruits in there. Do we leave them or do we dig them up and move them? There's a bunch of different varieties of grapes that kind of snuck out of a nursery bed and started climbing all over this elderberry that's now thicket forming and spreading and loaded with fruit and that's incredible and wonderful but what if we wanted to do other things in this area it's a very real and very interesting design challenge that i don't think i uh, would have anticipated in the past i might have described it in some hopeful and optimistic way of there's so many plants i don't know what to do with it but it's truly actually a compelling and challenging uh, scenario to figure out what to do with. We're doing some work. There's a common theme here of this transition moment where we transition from peak summer production to building the infrastructure and getting things prepped and seeded uh, to move some elements towards fall and winter needs. So for example, in this high tunnel that Sasha has been stewarding this summer in really beautiful ways. We still have our husk cherries. We just did a harvest of Tulsi or holy basil uh, low to the ground the other day. There are tomatoes through here. There is some marjoram and there are papalo and uh, basils and all sorts of wonderful mid-season hot crops. And then we just recently the other day you can see where there's really beautiful jet black soil, some aged compost that we put down and in this case, we seed it out to basil, but then we also are anticipating some of these lettuces that we did not interrupt. They've got lots and lots of seed. That'll fall in in betwixt the basils as they come up, maybe sit and enjoy the shade underneath them, and then hopefully come up in time that when the first frost hits in here, the lettuces have a chance as well. And we're probably pretty close to a first serious flower harvest of Mioga ginger of the season. Certainly what grows in the high tunnel presents the flowers first. And somewhere down in there, I don't think they're up just yet. We'll make a video when they come. But this has proven to be absolutely hardy out in the garden. So this is kind of a vestige of the original experiment of planting them in a sheltered space. I thought I dug all these out to be honest with you. And they not only came back, but somehow I must have put one over there. Maybe a vole moved it. 
Yikes, pretty wonderful. The same picture in here of that challenge of what do we do with nursery stock. This is a hazel I had nothing to do with. A chipmunk took them out of a nursery bed maybe two years ago and planted them in the high tunnel. They just always look so healthy, it's hard to make that call to move them. And they take so long to go dormant, it's hard to dig them up. And this is this year's hazel that a chipmunk put in. There is an American persimmon right next to the plastic. That's a hard one to figure out when to dig. So very real and also very wonderful challenges. Oh, there's another hazel. Yeah, so slowly but surely, the chipmunks are being very clear that it is foolishness that we're thinking about parsley and basil when this entire space could just be hazelnuts. The main garden is going through a similar metamorphosis, I guess, of what we just saw in the high tunnel, where we're trying to identify some areas where there's any sort of gap whatsoever. And with our system, that actually tends to be quite a hard thing to identify is openings and gaps to do different things with but there are some so for example here's a nursery bed that has nanking cherries and some shipmast locust root fragments that are coming up nicely and so this is nursery stock trees and shrubs that will be for sale later on there's some parsley on the edges and some transplanted apple seedlings from an apple that produces really late apples but there's a couple of inches in between and so we went through and added compost and sowed uh, uh, beets all throughout in here. And so there's an under sowing of beets in between some of the nursery stock that's in the area. We've soaked it really thoroughly and put some sawdust to reduce drying and heat stress. And so what we would hope to see is beets coming up in between in the fall the nursery stock goes dormant as the beets swell and become beautiful and we can dig them all up in one stroke. Fingers crossed we got the timing right on that one. There are some elements in here that have certainly gone and run away with themselves in beautiful ways and also ways that we'll need to be uh, interacting with. So in front of me here is Monarda fistulosa, which is a native bee balm. Stunningly beautiful. There's uh, that little lobster moth. I guess somebody was explaining that that crazy moth hummingbird hybrid, let me see if I can zoom in so you see, um, is actually the flying stage of the tomato hornworm. Am I remembering that correctly? Either way, boy, it's neat to see them in here. Um, but again, do we really want the garden to, over time, become simply Monarda fistulosa? It's certainly on track to fill this bed out thoroughly. So we'll let the bees and the lobsters have a tremendous amount of fun. And then once it goes dormant and senesces in the fall, hopefully have the bandwidth and time to dig them up along with this Burbank uh, it's called the Snowbank Blackberry which makes a completely white blackberry. They are happy here, happy to the point that without a trellis that is about almost nine feet tall and turns out they also love to sucker not only tip layer but run so they've escaped the bed and so more and more exquisitely beautiful plants what the heck do we do with them all? We've got a really impressive marshmallow. They showed up on their own. We think they're quite beautiful. So they'll stay here uh, for as long as the bees take interest in the flowers. And then we'll probably cut them relatively low and use that as a mid-season or later season mulch and fertilizer. The edge of this bed sown again to a fall crop, I believe, beets and radishes through here as an edge companion to the interior of the bed, which are all sorts of seedling apricots. Now I could intervene and cut this marshmallow back, but it's been a little hot and dry lately, so I'm just leaving it as is. You can see apricot seedlings all throughout. There's even some rooted goji plants that are being stool layered, so we're dumping more and more soil, kind of like you would hill potatoes, will hill the goji so they root more. Another variety of apricot, this seems incredibly promising. First year seedling, they're almost four feet tall in some spots. I could imagine seeing a five foot tall seedling in the first year. It's a varietal called Zard. I met a person online who works in Zone 4 Utah and has an um, orchard there and said, hey, what are your best tasting apricots that flower the absolute latest, make the largest fruit, and are the most reliable year after year? And sent him a hundred bucks and he sent me enough seed for six varieties. And so we've got little stands of all these different varietals of apricot seedlings tucked in the center of beds with us growing annuals around the edges for now. That theme plays out 
relatively frequently at this point. So in the center of a bed like here, got some wonderful cuttings of elderberry from our friend Buzz up at Perfect Circle Farm. I think this is a varietal called Berry Hill, which we haven't grown before. So these are hardwood cuttings for nursery purposes, either for sale or for our own internal use later on. It's a new variety to us. And the edge of the bed, which is now quite blurry, has been transplanted to Tulsi or holy basil. We did a little harvest on the edge here. Soon enough, we'll do a thorough harvest to reclaim a walkway through here. But Tulsi has done a really nice job as rabbit pressure throughout the season is real. The Tulsi is so intense and so aromatic and not that pleasant to rabbits that it's a living fence that's protecting the interior where elderberries and in this bed, grapes are rooting. So Tulsi providing incredible nectar flow and browse for a wide range of bees, supporting all sorts of flying insects, making seed that we can save for next year, being ready to be an incredible harvest that if we get the timing right, will rebound and provide another flush of flowers in the fall, medicine in the form of tea in the winter and protecting nursery crops from rabbit browse. Ooh, stacking functions. I may take a wander even deeper into the wetlands. This is the southwest corner of the garden, which is quite a wet area. You can see the cattails there where a hand dug pond, it's mainly silted in. And in fact, if we have time, we'll go over the pond we dug in with our neighbor uh, is just upslope here. And when the overflow finally happens, it wants to come in through this area. So these giant dinner plate sized white hibiscus flowers are tucked in. They love it here. This is a seedling black currant here. And then this whole wall of crazy vegetation are uh, eight different varieties of cultivar willows. And so we're hoping to have enough time to cut them flush to ground this winter, process the cuttings and offer a very diverse set of biomass and coarse and fine basket making willows. And in exchange, fingers crossed, if we can move all that plant material, we'll actually have some access through here and some light for some other things to happen. Uh, but in this wetland context, we've got these cattails growing we had nothing to do with and lots of frogs in there. The frogs brought the duckweed in. And so they're having fun, keeping the mosquitoes down a little bit. I think that's pickerel reed growing. And then real sweet, we're coming into the home stretch of the harvest is a sea berry. And these are on just enough of a knoll that they've got decent drainage. And believe it or not, we've already picked about a gallon and a half of fruit from this. This is a varietal called Radiant. And you get a sense of how insanely dense the fruit production is. These are some of the highest grade medicinal fruits we could be growing in this garden. Some pretty amazing research done in South Korea at the beginning of COVID indicating that fermented sea berry juice had incredibly positive effect on COVID cases. You can search that one online if you're interested. It's interesting. We won't hear about that in the news, of course, but growing your own medicine where you live, trying to set in motion enough abundance that others who don't have access to land um, or growing these sorts of medicines can harvest, all very worthwhile. And sea berry, uh, probably by next year, we'll have so many growing that we're going to try to figure out opening to a little bit wider to the general community to have them be able to harvest what they need for the medicine uh, medicine needs of their family. It's a fun corridor through here. There's just a wall of sea berry on the fence side, some actually completely unplanted sycamores that we'll dig out at some point, and then a wall of willows on the other side, and a course of waterway that flows actively in the winter and is just basically watercress and bone set during the peak summer. So finally, really being um, honest with ourselves and real with the interactions with the landscape and having our designs trend towards wetland crops as the dominant species in this space means we get higher yields overall because that is what this landscape wants to be. And rather than the standard practice of drainage ditch and you know, drainage tile and get all the water out of there so we can grow whatever we want. Start learning who are the plants that actually like really wet context. Put them in. Quit stressing about it and start eating more medicine and weaving baskets. A fair bit of this garden has gotten to the point of being so dense and so feral that it's, it almost excludes, uh, what's the right way to describe it? It feels like 
uh, we're not necessarily invited anymore. The pathways have been erased by the plant's expansion and they're healthy enough, they're dense enough, they're kind of moving in their own destiny. There's a fair bit of garden space that we have that started to enter into this new psychic realm of like, don't need to come in here, humans beware kind of vibe. Um, so we're going to wait till things fall asleep in the fall and then assess how we choose to interact with it. So cultivar stinging nettles that we got from Oikos tree crops. What do we do with those and all these rooted elderberries and willows from last year? Certainly they can't stay there for the long run, but it just feels like when a space starts to say very clearly that it would like to be left alone while it's actively growing, it seems okay for us to actually acknowledge that and let it be a little wild space. The only tricky bit is <laughs> very quickly almost all of this starts to have that feeling. So that's, that's part of the work with all this is that balance between what do we completely let go of saying that we need to have a say in the destiny of and crossing that or intersecting that with what are our actual food and medicine needs, what are our financial needs since we make our living from the plants that come from this garden, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sweetly complex scenario and something that I think we need to continually have dialogue with ourselves and with the spaces that we're working in. Um, and it's, it's the undecided middle ground that begets this kind of context, if that makes any sense. But back to a little bit more of a managed thought or some actual design directions, here again, Everywhere you see the sawdust and then miscanthus sticks. The miscanthus sticks are like a little flag from a distance to say for either Sasha and I, hey, we worked up this part of the soil and something is seeded here. And so we take it as a cue that whenever we have a watering can and it hasn't rained, make sure we water. And then when we see a pattern of a certain type of seedling coming up, be it lettuce or parsley or kale or arugula or beets or radishes, uh, that we can start weeding around them and facilitating them. And so in this space, for example, this was all uh, onions that we harvested the other day. We are leaving the purslane, we'll harvest and eat those as needed. And then everywhere that there's a gap, we seed it to beets. We're going real strong on beets. They're just pretty reliable for us here. And so they're coming up now, so we don't have to water as often. And then in a day or so, we'll harvest this purslane pretty close to ground, do a bunch of cooking of that, harvest these onions, and then sow that to perhaps a watermelon radish or black Spanish round radish, depending on the appropriate number of days that we have until fall. It's the July and August sowings that feel in some ways most critical for food resilience because getting the timing right on these storage crops so that they size up and come to fruition as the temperatures cool and the root cellar cools off enough to receive them is incredibly influential on how much of the food we're going to eat this winter will come from our backyard or how much we'll need to come from elsewhere. And it feels as though the more we pay attention to the news, which we're trying to do less and less, the more real-eyed we need to be that it is not unreasonable to suggest that absolutely within all of our lifetimes and maybe way, way sooner than that, that the food, if you can, grow uh, whatever food you grow where you live may be the food that you have. And so if you don't have space to grow lots of food, what are the connections and allied support networks you can uh, be part of? And if you have more space than you know what to do with, uh, what are the connections you can make with folks that don't have access to land so that we can all work together and actually grow the food and medicine we need as community uh, with one another? rather than that whole self-sufficiency, do it all on your own. How do we do this as community so we can move into an unknown future with really rich nourishing, nourishing meals while we sit around and discuss how we navigate? I'm thinking through the complexity of our nursery stock that could be moved out into uh, future planting spaces. Perhaps our neighbor says yes to more and more of his lawn and landscape being replaced with food or donating these plants to folks that are doing food justice and um, that sort of work in our community, maybe selling them if that's the pathway that makes the most sense or donating them to folks who can then sell them so they can have money, all sorts of different ways to go. Thinking about all these different types of foods and medicines and even once in a while some painkillers.
pretty long form video there. Lots of musings there. So I guess one way to just look at it is to say this is a pretty wild garden. It's moving in some directions on its own and we've got a little say here or there. And overall it's a fascinating space to be in and to feel the wildness of and to think about all the different yields that can come cascading out of this either with lots of intervention or also some passive observation and infrequent but pulsed intervention. Sincerely hoping that wherever you are in life, things are moving towards health and resilience, or if they are there, that they are staying in that way. Uh, have some great discussion down below. Share ideas, share resources, share what you're up to, and let's have more dialogue. I think the next video, or sometime soon, will go deeper into what's happening in our neighbor's yard. The rice is starting to head up and firm. The sea berries are finishing off. The elderberries are just getting ready to start. And on these days that are oppressively hot and muggy and sunny, it has been a blessing beyond blessings to be able to dip into this pond in our neighbor's spot. So we'll do an update on all that coming up relatively soon. And for now, thank you all for being part of the community that we have here, this extended community. And um, again, thank you so much for your comments and your input. It's probably one of the most commented on videos I've ever put out by a long shot um, that went up the other day. And for anyone that uh, contributed suggestions, we will be working on that. We'll get that put forward soon. And again, a thank you for those of you that had issues and concerns or problems with what I was putting forward and chose to put them in written words so others can see and so that I'd have a chance to take that in and learn from your feelings too. It's all valuable stuff, so thank you all for being part of that. Take care.